Welcome back, beautiful souls, to a transformative journey through compassion and holistic healing. I am happy to have you here as we take on a journey led by the insightful wisdom of none other than Dr. Gabor Mate. Today, we'll explore deeply into the depths of compassion for others and, more importantly, for ourselves, discovering the secrets to holistic healing and trauma recovery. Dr. Matei's expertise will enlighten, inspire, and empower you on your journey to well-being. So, without further ado, join Dr. Gabor Matei on this enlightening journey to discover the life-changing impact of compassion. In every tradition, in every healing tradition, stories and narratives are very important. And they tell us so much about human beings. Because from the scientific point of view, the interbeing, the interconnections, the what and what I call interpersonal biology is just how it is. So that people's emotions, emotional dynamics affect their physiology. And since our emotional dynamics are so determined by our relationships, what else is there except interbeing? Not to mention our connections to the natural environment and so on. So there's nothing new about this. Uh, traditional medic, uh, healing practices so as to how I came to it is because as a family physician, I couldn't help noticing that the people that got sick in my practice, that illness had everything to do with their lives, with their traumas, with their relationships, with the, how they felt about themselves, with how they related to their work, with the stresses in their lives. So it just became obvious to me. What I didn't realize is that there was all this science. So once I began to put together my own observations, you know, and, and over and over again, um, I find that people who, because of their illness, start questioning their whole lives, the illness comes along almost like a teacher. N not that I recommend it to anybody, but they learn about their true selves and how separate they're from their true selves and how, how healing has to do with reconnection and, 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 and understanding their place in the universe, you know? And so a lot of people they come to this wisdom through illness, unfortunately. And it's also the case that a lot of healing can happen when people began to understand the interconnections. And, and, and what happens is, in every case, there's a real change in life. People change their diet. People, they start to meditate. They start relating to nature differently. But the biggest difference is, they start relating to themselves differently. They have a complete transformation of their how they relate to themselves and their view of themselves. And they take agency over their lives. They In every healing tradition, stories and narratives are very important. And they tell us so much about human beings. When you talk about adversity, it's true that children have to learn to deal with adversity, but that doesn't mean we have to impose adversity on them. That's cruel. Life will bring its own adversities. I mean, life brings its own hurts and disappointments. The natural response in our brains, we are wired for certain emotions, grief and fear and panic and anger and love and playfulness and curiosity and so on. There's a reason why our brains are wired for this, because they're part of the fullness of life. When a child is grieving, to tell them, just get over it, is to make sure that they won't get over it. When a child is grieving because their cat died or they lost their favorite doll or whatever it is, you say, oh, you're feeling really sad. You're feeling really sad right now. Then a child will learn that the sadness will come, it'll go, they can handle it. So in order to help children deal with adversity. We don't impose adversity on them and we don't dismiss, um, we don't denigrate, we don't diminish their emotions, we validate them. And that's how a child learns to deal with adversity. 
as when it comes to adults and therapy, it's not a question of whining about the past. That's that's not you. That's not useful. You know, the stuff that happened to me when I was a year old, seventy-eight years ago, that happened. It's never not going to have happened. But how it shows up today in my life, that matters. So it's not a question of talking about the past as a way of whining about it. It's a question of understanding how is the past affecting my present. This idea that children should just get over it, or that adults shouldn't talk about the past, it's completely wrong-headed. We talk about the past not to dwell on it, not to make ourselves victims of it, but so we can learn from it and we can recognize how the imprints of the past show up in the present. So that we can actually take responsibility and get past it. So that's the point. I often talk about my epitaph. You know, the the graving, the, the engraving on my tombstone. You know what it's going to say? It's going to say, "It was a lot more work than I had anticipated." <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. Because you know what? As long as you know. Maybe once I become a Buddha, you know, or a really enlightened Rishi, and I don't, ex- I don't expect to get there, you know, then I can say, oh, now I know everything, you know, or I, you know, but I'm not there yet. Life is continually unfolding. I'm, I continue to come up against the imprints of the past, and I continue to learn from them, you know. And there's such a phrase as growing older. Now, what does it mean, growing older? It doesn't mean it. It could say getting older, and getting older is just aging. But what does it mean growing older? It means you can actually grow as you get older. Like your grandmother said, she lost her sight and she gained vision. And, and that's the process that goes on. So yeah, I'm I'm still having to deal with sometimes with the imprints of the past, and the task is to come into the present. And I and I think that's for most of us. I think that's a lifelong process. Mindfulness needs to be associated, or at least allied with, deep curiosity and and in, and and insight as well. And so, if you're an addicted person or somebody who's had addictions, you need to be compassionate to yourself. You need to say, "No, what's, not what's wrong with me? Why did I do all that? What purpose did it serve? Oh." It helps soothe my pain. Well, that's a totally different approach. If you're a parent or a relative of somebody with addictive patterns, instead of "What's wrong with them? Why don't they give it up?" you can say, "Well, hmm, why don't they give it up? What is it doing for them? What's the benefit? And what were the circumstances in their lives that encompassed the whole multi-generational family system that gave rise to their pain?" And sometimes people say, "Well, yeah, well, how come two, three kids grow up in the same family, and one of them becomes an addict, and the other one doesn't?" Two answers. One is, no two children grow up in the same family. No two children have the same parents, because they come along at different stages of the parents' lives. The parents see them differently, and they are different in the birth order, so there's different pressures on them. Number two. There is such a thing as genetic sensitivity, not genetic addiction. Addiction is not a disease, and it's certainly not a genetic disease. But if a child is more sensitive, then the same events will have a much greater impact on them. So the more sensitive you are, the more hurt you're going to be. The more creative you're going to be, the more intuitive you're going to be, and the more hurt you're going to be. The more hurt you are, the more you have to escape from your pain. So the great British child psychiatrist D. W. Winnicott said once that if a mother Could be the same mother to all eight of her children, which she couldn't be, he said. But if she could be, they still would have eight different mothers, because they would all be experiencing her, her through their own particular temperament. If we want people to give up their addictions, if our goal is to help them become fully who they are, but they don't have this emptiness that they have to keep filling from the outside, they need a lot of compassion. And uh, in compassion, I distinguish on several different levels. There is the compassion of just ordinary human compassion, which is I don't like to see people suffer. 
That's good. That's healthy. That's natural, but it's not enough. It has to be deepened by the compassion of understanding, where you actually say, not only do I not want this person to suffer, I want to understand why they're suffering. Otherwise, how can I help them? So then you start asking these questions that I've been addressing in this conversation. On the third level, there's what I call the compassion of recognition, where you see that, ah, they're not different from me. I recognize the same things in myself. Therefore, I'm in no position to be above them, you know, to judge them. We're two people, equal, in a significant way, sharing the same experience. And I, I, I could go on, but there's different levels of compassion, but it's absolutely essential for, for helping addicted people. And as one of my teachers, A. H. Alma, says, only when compassion is present will people allow themselves to see the truth. You want people to see the truth? They can only do so when they feel safe. So my advice to families, parents, caregivers, adult children, friends of people with addictions is that there's three ways you can be in relationship to your addicted relative or friend. Two of them are insane. One of them is sane. One way is you can be in their lives and try to change them. That's insane. It means that you're codependent. It means that you're feeling better it depends on them feeling better. So now you're dependent on somebody who's dependent. That's what codependency means. It doesn't work. Because the basic trauma that we all experience, and it doesn't take abuse or terrible circumstances, is that we're not accepted for who we were. Now, if you want to approach your addicted client or friend or, or relative with the same, I don't accept who you are, I want you to be different, for me to be happy, that's to invite resistance. It's insanity. Thank you for joining us on this interesting journey with Dr. Gabor Mate. If you found today's video helpful, please give this video a thumbs up and share it with others who might benefit. If you haven't already, subscribe to our channel and click the notification bell to stay up to date on future content. Remember that the journey to compassion and holistic healing is ongoing and your insights and experiences are valuable. Share your thoughts in the comments section below and let's create a supportive community committed to personal growth and well-being. Stay tuned for more inspiring discussions and until next time, be kind to yourself and others. I wish you a life full of compassion, resilience, and profound healing.